Thanks. Council. I'd like to add uh, affordable housing on a closed session, please. Affordable housing yes, in closed? Yeah, thank you. You want to bring that up when we have the closed with uh, our CAO? Thank you. Somebody move the adoption of the agenda. Councilor Gamano. All in favor? Any corrections or amendments from the February 8, 2023 regular meeting of council? If none, someone move the adoption of the minutes. Councilor Evans. All in favor? Okay, proclamations. 70th anniversary of the Pemina Cardium Field. Pemina Cardium Field, 70th anniversary, February 23rd, 2023. Whereas in 1953, the Pemina oil field was discovered about 133 kilometers southwest of Edenton. And whereas this field, the largest Stratigraphic oil trap in Western Canada, with the exception of the oil sands of the McMurray Foundation, quickly surpassed all others and became Alberta's largest oil field. And whereas two companies, Seaboard Oil and Silkeny Vacuum Exploration Company, united together and began exploring for oil. And whereas drilling began on February 23, 1953, and June 10, 1953, the well began to produce oil. At the time, the technique used had never been success successfully applied in Canada. The odds were not considered favorable. However, on June 10th, after completion of the procedure, the well, produ the well began to produce, and whereas Silkeny Seaboard No. 1 was the first cardium well in Alberta and the first well drilled in the Pemna oil field, and whereas the Pemna discovery had a tremendous impact on the future of oil exploration and the region, and whereas the town of Drayton Valley <clears throat> is celebrating the 70th anniversary of the discovery of the Pemina Cardium Field, with the town-wide celebration on June 23rd and June 24th, 20, 2023. Therefore, I, Deputy Mayor Bill Bellis, on behalf of the Council of the Town of Drayton Valley, do, by, do hereby proclaim <clears throat> February 23rd, 2023, as the 70th anniversary of the discovery of the Pemina Cardium Field in the Town of Drayton Valley. Dated Town of Drayton Valley Province, Alberta, this 23rd date of February 2023. The next proclamation is Pink Shirt Day. And I see everyone's got their pink shirts on. I would like to recognize that today is Pink Shirt Day. Pink Shirt Day is celebrated on the last Wednesday of February each year. People wear pink shirts to signify the stand against bullying. Approximately one in five kids are bullied, 47%. 47% of Canadian parents have at least one child that has been a victim of bullying. Around one third of the population has experienced bullying as a child, and around one third of teenagers have been bullied recently. Bullying is a grow, growing pro problem in the world today, and every year people hear of more and more incidents coming up regarding bullying in schools everywhere. And although it's certainly a problem within schools, bullying doesn't stop there. It extends to the world outside of school and even to the virtual world of the internet where young people have created a bit of world of their own. National Pink Day is the day dedicated to beating the bullies and breaking the cycle that creates and perpetuates this damaging behavior inside and outside of schools. Okay. Hey, Mayor um, Ballas, <coughs> it's interesting, <coughs> excuse me, that it's Pink Shirt Day and, um, and I don't notice it on the agenda, but the proclamation uh, obviously was out there uh, somewhere. And so I'm, I'm curious and would have been interested in um, you're wearing a pink shirt today, but Camilla is the only guy that nailed it down. And so I missed the memo, and I hate to miss the memo if it's a red shirt day or pink day. Um, um, so just thinking about communications from here on in, we should try to either draw it to the, because I did read the agenda. And so 
Yes, yeah, so we had already discussed maybe putting it on the on our calendars for next year. So we had a little more forethought into it. But yes, I will make a note of that. Thanks, Silver. It was an oops. Thank you. Okay, we'll move on to 6.1, non statutory public hearing, February 22nd, 2023, discretionary use development permit DV 23 005, 2050 50th Street, eating establishment and drive through. And this is Mr. Connors. Uh, thank you. If you could just read in the uh, start of the public hearing, please. Okay, thank you. I declare the public hearing open for development permit at uh, 9.09 a.m. Development permit application DB 23005. Present is council administration and uh, those online. Purpose of the public hearing is to receive comments, concerns, and questions from the public regarding the proposed discretionary use of a drive through with a newly proposed establishment eating and drinking at 2050 50th Street. Background. Administration received a development permit application to allow for a new building containing an establishment eating and drinking with a drive through attached. The property is zoned C Gen, Commercial General District, where drive throughs are considered a discretionary use. Discretionary use must be decided by the Town Council, acting as the Municipal Planning Commission per land use bylaw section 1.13C. A decision on this application will be made today, depending on the comments received at this public hearing. Notification of the bylaw requesting comments from the public and adver advising them of the public hearing has been provided in accordance with the Town of Drayton Valley Bylaw 2018-07A Electronic Advertising Bylaw. To facilitate the public hearing process, any comments received written or verbal will be presented as a package at the time of the public hearing. Administration will read out any written submissions received. Any written? Uh, good morning. So pertaining to today's public hearing regarding discretionary use request for development permit DV 23005 to allow for a drive through use in conjunction with the new build establishment eating and drinking at 2050 50th Street, administration has received no comments back from the public, neither in support nor opposition. Administration is aware of some online public excitement around the proposal with interest and speculation in knowing the brand of the establishment seeking to open on site. Per conversations with the applicant, requirements under APPI Professional Code of Practice, Schedule 4, and advisement of our FOIC personnel, the specific brand of the eating establishment in this proposal was opted not to be released, as it is outside the scope of the decision before you today. The land use bylaw regulates the use, not the user or specific brand, and the decision is on the permitting of a drive through in conjunction with an establishment eating and drinking. Administration's comments on the proposal will be delivered as part of the subsequent decision item pertaining to this application. Thank you. Is there any other comments from the floor? Any comments from anyone online? Seeing as there is none, I'll declare the public hearing closed. Move on to the next item, 7-1, RCMP Delegation Acting Staff, Sergeant Ryan Holtmeyer. Welcome, sir. Good morning, everybody. So I just have some quick stats for you today. I think they'll, can we go to the one with the green and the red? So these are our January numbers. Um, now keep in mind that January, we're only now comparing January this year to January of last year. But uh, we had a nice down month in January, actually. We saw a decrease in our person's crime, which was way higher for our 2022. Um, now it's just a quick snapshot, but instead of having like 17 occurrences last January, we had only eight. Um, and then our overall criminal code calls went down by 71%. So we actually were a lot slower in January, which was nice actually for the way kind of 2022 was. Uh, and it kind of continues the trend. We really saw in October, 
that our crime stats started to drop October, November, December, and it's just continuing that trend. So it's a good trend. Uh, there's no guarantee that it will continue, but we're hopeful and we're trying to stay on, stop, on top of stuff so that it does. The only thing that's up a little bit is still our theft unders. That's still our kind of motor vehicle thefts, people going around at night checking doors. So it's not theft of vehicles, they're still down, um, but just our theft from vehicles. And there's some shoplifting actually. We've had a bit of an increase in shoplifting as well from our Canadian Tires, Rexall, uh, Walmart. Um, just low end, you know, 20, $30 shopliftings, but they get scored as our theft unders. So that was our January, it was a nice January. All in all, any questions about that? Thank you, I see you have a guest. But I do, I brought somebody with me, I've been doing that the last couple of times. This is Constable Izzy Sanford. Izzy has been here for about a year and a half. He comes to us from Mississauga, Ontario. So, and this is his first spot. Welcome, sir. Yeah, uh, other than that, uh, personnel update. Uh, our corporal, who's one of our general duty corporals who's coming, has been named. His name's Roderick Johnson, and I talked to him last week. He's hoping to be here within 30 days. He's coming out of Red Deer Detachment. Um, so we should have that spot filled in the next 30. And our staff sergeant uh, that's coming, Troy Raditz, he has his house for sale in Spruce Grove right now. So he's hoping to get that sold and get here. He's hoping April. So we should have some reinforcements fairly soon. Council, any questions? Councillor Evans. <laughs> uh, just wondering, is there any particular reason that, that you folks are aware of for the, for the decrease other than your hard work? Uh, I think it's, it's, as I said before, like especially property and motor vehicle thefts, it's really dependent on the offenders who are in custody and are not in custody. Now, unfortunately, we have had a couple that just got released in January, so I'm curious to see what our February numbers are. A um, couple of them are already on warrant and we're actively looking to grab them. Um, yeah, our crew team's going to be here uh, in the next uh, couple of weeks as well, looking to scoop up a couple of these guys that we've identified doing crime already and stealing some cars. So we're hoping to grab them. But um, yeah, that's it. And then person's crime is so hard um, because as I, I think I've talked about that before, how it's usually a crime of emotion and in the moment. And so I don't, I, I don't have a real reason for why the person's crimes dropped. Um, yeah. But, but the property, especially the vehicle thefts, that is who's in custody and who's not. Yeah. So you're taking no credit since you became active. That's right. No. <laughs> <laughs> I would love to. <laughs> Any other questions? Councillor Gabenz. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Good, morning. Good morning. You know, you mentioned about shoplifting. Uh, like you're saying, you know, it's a small amount and, um, you know, it, it's a headache for the business owner as well, right? Mm -hmm. So is there any tips or tricks that you can give for a um, business owner that, you know, how to handle something like that? Yeah, it's tough. Like, um, Cause it's taking your time, going yeah, your time and all the that tips too. I have is make sure you have good surveillance mm -hmm. in there. And then I know loss prevention officers cost money, but if you're a bigger store, like Walmart has one, if you're a bigger store, then mm -hmm. that's usually pretty... Uh, pretty effective. I mean, often you can pick off the people that are in your store wandering aimlessly that might be looking to shoplift. And I know Walmart's pretty successful in that with their loss prevention officer. So mm -hmm. investing in a loss pre prevention officer might, you know, save you, even if some business got together and had it on a cycle where they would have somebody together would be advantageous. And the other thing is don't be afraid to confront people. I mean, you can refuse business to anyone if you feel that they're not there to purchase you can right. ask them to leave so but yeah thank you and then yeah good surveillance so. and willing to follow through with charges at the end of it is helpful perfect thank yeah. you Councilor McGee. um <clears throat> good morning uh, ryan and welcome is he uh, to the team it's a bit cold, but uh, it gets better. <laughs> um, two questions I have, uh, Ryan. Uh, the first one, uh, following up on Councillor Gamana's uh, question about shoplifting, um, do they ever get to court? Or, or is it that crime of opportunity, those things that, I just I'm curious whether or not they actually get there. 
Um, yeah, at times they do, and at times they don't. Our Crown Prosecutor obviously has the ability to make decisions, and he carries the whole caseload, and he decides what goes and what doesn't, and has complete, uh, mm. like that's completely out of our hands. That is completely in his hands, and okay. they have, in her hands, so they have the opportunity or the ability to just clear and just say, I'm not prosecuting that, even if there's evidence. And sometimes they do, just because of court time. Right. Um, and to be honest, there's certain things that, Prosecutions, like the self-checkouts, prosecutions do not like that and do not like to prosecute that. Just with the, there's some case law around that that makes it tough with, uh, you know, there's the person that scans half their items, but it's it's tough. and uh, Yeah, so yeah. those things are tough. But, uh, yeah, not to speak for the Crown, but we do see that... Uh, those low end shop liftings are the first ones that will get moved off the books because there's, yeah, they, if they have other priorities, then those go without. And generally repeat offenders? Yep. Yep. 100%. Okay. The uh, second question I have is um, as we move into minus 40, uh, do we specifically at the RCMP do anything different? We've got sort of four or five days. Uh, so do you? You have that Monday morning meeting and say, listen, we're heading into this cold weather. Here's what we're, we're contemplating. Yeah, we don't really do anything different. Uh, not a ton, like maybe a little more patrols at night, but uh, um, not a ton. In fact, often we see crime go down when it's cold, just because it's cold. <laughs> but uh, yeah, we don't do a ton different. We will... The guys and girls will be running around quite a bit at night, but the town's kind of set up, especially with our homeless population, to shelter them now anyways through this through cold snaps. So we don't do a ton different. We might lodge people a little quicker. I will say that. If we pick somebody up, we'll probably take them. If they can't go to one of the shelters, we'll take them to shelter them with us and just hold them for a little bit. But that might be the only difference. And if you found someone at midnight... Um, at 40 below and the shelters close at 11. Uh, the next obvious might be uh, just to curl up uh, at your house. And, yeah. Not your house, but... Yes. <laughs> not my personal house, but yes. <laughs> yep. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Great. Thank you. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I don't think my wife would enjoy that too much. Thank you, Ryan. That's yeah, no problem. Thank you. Any further questions? Thank you. Ryan, for your report and uh, look forward to you continuing in your role until such time as the new person arrives. <laughs> so good. you're doing an excellent job and we thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. No business arising from the delegation. Okay, we'll move on to our decision items. 9-1, Enforcement Service Annual Report. Cody? Well, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm pleased to present to you today the 2022 Enforcement Services Annual Report. Um, firstly, I'd like to express our gratitude uh, to Administration Council who have supported us in new initiatives throughout 2022. Um, and without the continued support and trust, uh, we would not be able to accomplish what we did throughout the year. Uh, our team has worked diligently throughout the year and we have accomplished several uh, noteworthy projects that I believe has benefited the community, the organization, um, and the department. We've also had a few challenges this year, including rebuilding the department, having reduced staffing for over five months of the year, and navigating priorities of the organization. Our teams also continue to focus on improving our services to the com community, and we have always uh, find ways, or we're continuing to find ways <clears throat> 
uh, to make improvements on how we do business um, within the Enforcement Services Department. With that said, I'd like to get into a high-level review of the um, Enforcement Services Annual Report. Nathan, can we go to the next? Um, so, um, we start off the annual report with a message from General Manager uh, Tom Thompson. I'm um, just talking about high level of uh, what the department's been up to, um, some challenges throughout the year, um, different opportunities that the Community um, Enforcement Services branch has been up to, um, and what Tom's biggest uh, view of the department. I think a positive movement that we did throughout the year was the incorporation of the new community standards bylaw, um, where we've been able to have a lot of traction and movement with uh, cleaning up some properties throughout the community. So, thank you. Um, so to get into the purpose of the annual report, so um, through the Peace Officer Act and its um, regulations and policies with province, um, all authorized employers, including Town of Drayton Valley, are required to submit an annual report to the province by January 31st of every year. So that is the main purpose, is we have to do it through legislation. Now, normally a report to the province is four pages tops and you can be done. Um, when looking at doing our annual report for the year, we decided to be a little bit more transparent, be more open to the public. And instead of just doing a report to the province, let's do a report to the community. What did we do in the community? Let's let's showcase ourselves. Let's showcase what we've done in the community. So um, through that, um, again, going back to what the province requires, they require us to describe the general nature of the services, um, describe the enforcement and related activities that the peace officers are involved in, uh, name and contact information for primary and secondary contacts, any statistical data, and um, the peace officers that were employed during the time. So, like I said, their information could be pretty basic, so four or five pages. Um, we want to get more in-depth in this report. So, um, as we continue, um, quick information about our community. So, just shy of 7,000 people as of 2021. Um, we have nine schools and we're approximately 130 kilometers from Edmonton's capital. Um, about enforcement services, we're comprised of both community peace officers as well as bylaw enforcement officers. Um, we strive to improve safety and the quality of life of our residents and visitors by observing uh, bylaws and provincial statute violations during the execution of the officer's duties. And we're committed to serving residents and providing professional service um, in the fields of enforcement. Um, we do our duties with honesty, integrity, and diligence while striving for consistency, fairness, and impartiality that uh, leads to the community to voluntarily comply um, through education and enforcement. We work with our um, other law enforcement part partners, nonprofit, um, and other departments to accomplish this. Um, it's important that enforcement services does not investigate or respond to criminal code uh, matters. That is the responsibility of the police of jurisdiction, so the RCMP. Um, if we do get any calls for criminal code matters, we do refer them back to the RCMP, um, as we cannot investigate those whatsoever. Um, there's a couple aspects of the... Drayton Valley strategic and corporate business plans that um, more so pertain to enforcement services. Um, firstly, it's the community cleanup, beautification, and standards. Um, and secondly, the um, safety and enforcement um, and community policing, enhancing uh, the sense of well being um, and to attract businesses, um, immigration, residential developments to the area, et cetera. So, Services provided by enforcement services. Um, we have approximately 12 different um, <laughs> provincial statutes that enforcement services um, has the authority to um, enforce. So that ranges from the Animal Protection Act, the Gaming Liquor and Cannabis Act, uh, the Traffic Safety Act, Trespass to Premises Act, et cetera. When we get into municipal bylaws, um, we enforce any enforceable bylaw that is enacted enacted or amended by council. So some examples of those are the animal control bylaw, the community standards bylaw, uh, the fire service bylaw, the traffic bylaw, etc. 
Um, throughout 2022, um, as I previously mentioned, mentioned in the preamble there, um, we've experienced some staffing challenges throughout um, the year, uh, where the department operated at 50% capacity for over five months. So that was in January and February prior to my attendance. Um, and then again in October, November and December, um, we've been short with the other officer. So this reduction in staffing um, has greatly reduced the amount of proactive work that the, the department is able to do, um, as well as when it comes to engagement with the community, it's, it's definitely um, reduced the amount of engagement that we can do um, as we are at limited staffing levels. Um, further to that, um, as of December 31st of 2022, the level two community peace officer appointment uh, for our other officer, um, the province has removed the ability for those to be operational. So um, the level two peace officer authority as of December 31st is now gone. Um, so now we have currently have one peace officer um, and one bylaw enforcement officer. Um, as council may recall, uh, we did get approval for in the 2023 budget for an additional peace officer position, which we're actively recruiting for. So um, hopefully in the next little while that that person can come on and um, our staffing levels can increase and sub subsequently um, our proactive and community engagement and stuff like that can increase as well. So um, throughout the year, um, both myself and Officer Megan Kennedy were the officers uh, that worked with Enforcement Services. We report directly to the General Manager of Protective Services, Tom Thompson. Uh, we work within their statutory requirements um, for the peace officer side stuff through the peace officer policies, uh, legislation, and then our own internal policies and procedures. Um, and on the bylaw side of the house, um, work within the confines of um, the Municipal Government Act, uh, the bylaw enforcement officer bylaw, and internal policies and procedures. Um, between Megan and myself, we have over 13 years of experience in law enforcement um, and investigative roles in private sector, municipal government, and provincial government. So when we do a look back into 2022, um, there's been a lot that's happened um, throughout the year, especially with enforcement services. Um, some of the changes that occurred, um, just as a recap for some council might remember this, uh, some might be new to them. Um, it, we created the new bylaw enforcement officer bylaw. There was the creation of the, the new community standards bylaw. There was the completion of the enforcement services satisfaction and priorities survey. Uh, the creation and the use of a dedicated enforcement services Facebook page. Um, we implemented a new records management system and new processes and controls to ensure proper usage. Um, we added emergency response to the level one community peace officer authorities. We added high uh, primary highway enforcement, so that's Highway 22. Um, we participated in the community safety committee. We started to use electronic ticketing. Uh, we took over enforcement of the Weed Control Act and the Agricultural Pest Act. Uh, we began manag managing Travis permits. And we began using, as with the rest of the organization, uh, citywide. So in addition to those, um, we've been able to assist other departments, such as planning and development, uh, public works, um, to review different bylaws, um, to make sure that they're um, as effective as possible. We've provided some comments to them prior to coming to council. Um, we've also worked with Alberta Transportation Public Works to ensure that there's proper signage throughout the community and on the highways uh, to make sure that they're complying with applicable legislation, that they're not um, causing confusing messaging, stuff like that. Uh, we took the lead in the creation of the closed circuit uh, television camera report, um, which eventually was brought forward to council um, through the budget process, where $86,500 was allocated towards that. Um, and on behalf of the town enforcement services, um, took lead and applied for the Alberta crime prevention grant. Um, hopefully we'll find out within the next month on if we were successful with that. Um, through that grant, we, our approach with it was creating a safer community. If we are approved, we will be approved for up to $150,000 for 2023 and $150,000 in 2024 towards initiatives, um, on improving safety in the community. Um, if the grant is accepted by the province, some of the initiatives that we identified through there were enhanced patrols in the community, community presentations, training, additional camera equipment and monitoring, uh, safety surveys, purchasing of electronic bikes and equipments for patrols on the trail system, and advertisement amongst others. As I mentioned, um, we should find out probably within the next month on whether or not uh, we were successful with that. Um, in addition, 2022, we spent over 41 hours conducting patrols in school zones, just shy of nine hours conducting patrols in playground zones, and there were 22, over 2,200 Travis permits that were issued. 
Uh, when we get into some community engagement, uh, we participated with the Terry Fox Run at the El Dorado School. Uh, we attended the Welcome Assembly at the HW Pickup School. Um, had some visits to the 55 uh, Seniors Club, the Rodeo, Light Up Parade, Grade 12 uh, Parade, a couple of the community dinner street parties, and attendance at some Thunder Hockey games. Um, in addition, we've uh, became more involved and provided more information to the community by, community by using our social media uh, channels. Um, as Council may recall, we completed the Satisfaction and Priority Survey. Um, in the summer there, it was three weeks, um, advertised ver through various modes, and we ended up receiving 168 responses. Um, some high-level information about that, um, some issues facing enforcement services, um, speeding, more enforcement, more staffing, unsightly properties, snow removal, um, any comments or suggestions on how to improve, um, or any additional priorities. Um, they were looking for transparency, deal with barking dogs, hire more staff, more presence, um, more visible in school zones. Um, when we get into... What should the priorities be for enforcement services over the next couple of years? Um, we categorize the top three. Uh, when you combine the themes, the top three were traffic, unsightly properties, and animal control slash animal protection. Um, so those were the three priorities of the respondents. And lastly, understanding um, that enforcement services was tax, support, tax supported, which, more, which would you most likely support? Um, 41% wanted an increase in enforcement, 50% maintain, um, and seven was decreased. So um, that information has been very useful on administrative uh, side on kind of planning some priorities, uh, determining um, next steps, stuff like that. Um, when we get into satisfaction of the department, 55% uh, were either satisfied or very satisfied with the department, 52% um, were satisfied or very satisfied with the customer service that they received. 64% were satisfied or very satisfied when it comes to a response in a reasonable amount of time. And 41% were satisfied with um, how staff were doing everything to our sister needs. So again, that last one, definitely the 41%, um, definitely some room to improve on that one. So uh, we're still working on hopefully getting that up um, in the future. So a quick overview of our enforcement services social media that we implemented there. It came into place April of 2022. Um, it was meant to increase transparency and increase our access to the public and connect with residents, businesses, and visitors uh, more effectively. We worked with communications to implement this program. Um, at the creation of this report, there were over 750 followers. We've added at least another 100 to that since. Um, through 2022, we were able to reach 28,000 just shy of 29,000 people, and we had just shy of 6,000 people that clicked on our page to learn more about enforcement services. So um, in my view, that's definitely very positive when people starting to learn uh, what's going on in the community from the enforcement services aspect. Um, and, and we like to put lots of stuff on there on some education um, so that people can voluntarily comply um, with, with provincial statutes and municipal bylaws. Um, if they don't know something's a law, it's hard to follow it, right? So if they know something such as uh, sidewalks need to be shoveled within 48 hours, better chance that they're going to actually comply with that if they just thought they had a week, for example, right? So um, as we continue on, some learning opportunities for enforcement services throughout the year, Indigenous training, use force training, building trust in municipalities, workplace violence, um, prevention, um, stuff like that. When we get into the different complaints that were received, um, 340... We had a total of 625 complaints uh, throughout the year, which is a 260% increase from 2021 from the information that we could locate. Um, through that, 347 or 57% of the complaints were received by phone. Um, of the 625 complaints, we investigated 1,048 different things. So for example, if someone calls um, that... It's one complaint, but they have three properties that are unsightly, for example. Um, that is three different investigations on one complaint. So it just kind of tries to capture, it is a little bit confusing, um, but it does try to capture the actual work that we are doing, the actual investigations we are doing there. Uh, through that, uh, we had 513 tickets and warnings issued by officers. Those are primarily through uh, proactive traffic enforcement. There's a little bit on animal control, a little bit on unsightly properties, but the majority of that does come from um, 
tickets um, or proactive traffic such as stop signs, cell phones, stuff like that. Um, our busiest day of the week uh, for calls coming in was or complaints coming in was on Tuesday. The busiest time of the day for when complaints would come in was between 11 a.m. and 12 p.m. Um, busiest month of the year was September. Um, why those are, I have no idea. So um, we'll see how things kind of go as years years progress on whether that changes or if that's a good trend. Um, that definitely gives us, I'll, I'll get into it a little bit more, but it, this kind of information does give us good, good insights on um, properly scheduling of staff and stuff like that. So um, we want to make sure we have staff in on Tuesdays. We want to make sure that we have staff in between 11 and 12. We want to make sure maybe September is not a good month to do uh, vacations kind of thing, right? So it does start giving us some analytics that we can properly start staffing um, the, the department um, and making some proper decisions on that. Um, previously, you know, I mentioned the top three priorities uh, through the satisfaction survey were traffic, um, community standards, and so unsightly properties, and animal-related incidents. So I captured those as kind of the top three on this as well. So we had 210 investigations related, relating to traffic complaints. We had 248 investigations relating to community standards. And we had 445 investigations relating to animal control-related items. So we get into some complaint types. So this is just broken down into the specific, specific piece of legislation for the most part. So we have our provincial legislations listed on top. We then have our municipal bylaws listed kind of in the middle there. And then we have some kind of assists um, and some different categories down at the bottom. Again, uh, through that, that equals up to 1,048 investigations throughout the year. Um, So again, or uh, continuing some complaints by locations. When we do our files, um, we we've categorized the municipality into five different quadrants, if you want to call it that. Um, we have northeast, northwest, southeast, southwest, and then the industrial area. So we use 50th Ave and 50th Street as the main main two areas to kind of split the community, and then we use the section for industrial roads. So 34th Avenue, I believe it is, so kind of equal to kind of warehouses area, um, and south below we consider that industrial. So throughout the year, um, southeast was the busiest quadrant, if you want to call it that. Um, however, when you look at the southeast, there is more houses, more people in that area, so it is kind of expected there's going to be a little bit more. So if we kind of keep that in mind, it is pretty pretty common throughout the each quadrants minus industrial um, for where we are spending our time on complaints. Um, when we get into method of uh, complaints, um, we accept complaints by phone. We accept complaints by walking up at the counter to walking up to the officer um, by email or citywide. So 57% um, of the complaints came through phone. 15% um, came through online or email. So that's like citywide or sending an email. 15% uh, were officer observed, so that's proactive files. 4% uh, were walk up to normally like the, the front counter at the town office here with a concern. And 9% were in person. Now, the one I really want to talk about is the 9% in person. It's a low number if you want to think about it, but in all actuality, it's not a low number. That 9% is when a staff member such as myself, we're in the community, we're sitting on the side of the road, uh, we're walking the trails, and a public member of the public comes up to us with concern. Now, especially in the last couple of years with the public's view on law enforcement, it's been a lot more negative in the last couple of years than, than historically. Um, people's view of law enforcement's not always positive. Um, lots of people are, are afraid or are scared of law enforcement kind of thing. So to still have 9% of people um, coming up to a staff member as, as they're sitting there and expressing their concerns, I think that's a win. That's uh, 53 of our complaints were of people coming up to us. So that shows that they're, um, they, they're not scared of us. They're willing to come up and talk to us. So um, I think as as our, our staffing levels increase, um, if we get this grant where we're out on the trails more, we're on bikes more, I think that number is going to increase. And I think that's a good number that, that we would increase. I, I'd love to see that number um, get up a lot more than 9%. Sometimes it is hard, but um, although 9%, it is a positive number in my view. Um, getting into complaints by day a week. So previously I mentioned Tuesday was the busiest day, um, followed by Wednesday with one less. So again, um, 
when when the complaints are coming in, Saturdays and Sundays are currently the slowest times that we're getting complaints. Um, for the most part, we're not working many weekends right now. Um, again, once once staffing levels get back to where they should, um, hopefully that that fluctuates. But again, um, once people once public start seeing us working on the weekends, I foresee some of our numbers are going to go up a little bit more on the weekends. But currently, um, it's that Tuesday, Wednesday are the primary uh, times that we're getting complaints. Um, and again, the primary time that complaints are coming in are between 11 and 12 um, p.m. Not really much, or yeah, 11 a.m. and 12 p.m. Um, not really much kind of come that 8 o'clock-ish p.m. until about 8 o'clock in the morning. There are a couple complaints that are coming in here and there. Um, but again, when we're looking at scheduling and stuff like that, sure, let's have some evening coverage and stuff like that. But I, I don't think having some um, late nights, early mornings is is really what we need. We'll get some proactive work out of that, but people aren't going to call us at 11 o'clock at night with an unsightly property um, complaint, and we're not going to go knocking on the door telling someone to cut their grass at 11 o'clock at night either, right? So um, definitely gives us some some analytics to, again, continue with some uh, decisions for the department. Um, getting into warnings and tickets, uh, as previously mentioned, we had 509 um, throughout the year. Primarily, those are from moving violations such as speeding, distracted driving, stop signs, um, etc. But there are some regarding animals, uh, such as animal at large, um, unsightly properties, etc. Um, so in 2022, the department issued 277 warnings and 232 tickets. Um, so roughly, that's about a 45 to 55% split on tickets to warnings. So um, the department's not heavy handed when it comes to all we're doing is warnings. We're not heavy handed on all we're doing is tickets kind of thing, right? I think it's a good balance that we have. Um, and I think it's important that we do have, have a balance um, some, such as that. <clears throat> of the 232 tickets that were issued um, in 2022, we've had eight not guilty pleas being made. Um, one has changed their uh, pleaded guilty before trial, one was convicted in absence when they failed to attend, one was convicted on their charges after going to trial, and five are awaiting trial. This isn't a full capture of what we could have. Uh, for example, if you're issuing a ticket in December, um, court date's not in December, it's not going to be until February or March. So we could have a couple more trickling in the next little bit, but um, under 5% of people that are being charged are are currently disputing um, the charges. So um, again, I think that's positive in the sense on we're not not charging the innocent per se, if you want to want to say that, right? Where our charges are are solid that are going through. Um, so yeah, we'll we'll see how that kind of plays out as as years go on. Um, complaints against peace officers and bylaw officers. Um, so under the peace officers are regulated under the peace officer act when it, and its regulations and policy when it comes to um, complaints and then bylaw officers are regulated under the bylaw bylaw enforcement officer bylaw and then again our internal policies and procedures when i talk about the following complaints um, it is when the officer is acting in the capacity of either the peace officer or in the capacity of a bylaw officer so um, in 2022 both megan and myself were both duly appointed as community peace officers and as bylaw enforcement officers. So when the complaints come in, it's are you acting in the capacity of a peace officer or are you acting in the capacity of a bylaw officer? And then the complaints are dealt with accordingly to that. So in 2022, we had one complaint um, from the public against a peace officer, um, which was unfounded. And in 2022, we had one employer initiated complaint against a bylaw officer, which was founded. Um, so a look ahead into 2022, um, or sorry, 2023, um, there's going to be an addition of another peace officer, um, the addition of another peace officer vehicle. Um, we recently purchased a used 2013 Dodge Charger. Um, so we've got a little bit of things to change decals and stuff like that on the side. So hopefully when the new officer starts, um, we have a vehicle and we're ready to go with it. <clears throat> Uh, we have the possibility of receiving the crime prevention grant um, and then starting with the initiatives identified through the grant. Um, there's going to be the renewal of the memorandum of understanding the MOU with uh, Drayton Valley and the RCMP pertaining to peace officers. And that expires in about a month and a half-ish. Um, we're going to work towards advocating for changes towards PTSD with community peace officers, which council is aware of. Uh, we're going to be implementing new policies and procedures. We're going to be creating a new multi-year traffic safety plan. 
We're going to explore a regional MOU between the town and Drayton Valley for Peace Officer Services. Uh, we're going to see the install of secure, uh, CCTV cameras um, throughout the community. Um, we're going to explore any additional authorities for peace officers that may be a benefit to the community, and we're going to be reviewing the animal control bylaw. Um, throughout that, we're going to be continuing to, continuing to review the internal uh, practices and pr procedures of the department to ensure that we're being as effective in our roles as possible um, and that we're being provided with effective oversight when doing so. Um, quick overview of budget 2022, uh, we were allocated 271,000 in 2023, we were allocated 377,000 for uh, the Enforcement Services Department. Um, the contact information, this is more of a province thing, just who do they, who do they need contact, um, but again for the public, uh, they can contact Enforcement Services by phone, by email, by citywide. Um, or in person kind of thing. So, um, and as always, the public and council, if you have Facebook as well, this is for you. Uh, you can follow us on our Enforcement Services Facebook page to uh, see what, what the department's up to and if there's anything going on. <clears throat> so um, I'd like to thank the hardworking team um, and uh, as well the um, other departments and the um, organizations, nonprofits and stuff that we've worked with throughout the year. Um, without everyone's um, help, um, we, wouldn't, we wouldn't have been able to get where we were today. So thank you for all that. Um, and I'd like to express our gratitude to the community for the community continued support, trust, and encouragement as well for the, the department. So um, with that being said, I'd, like, I'd be happy to answer any questions that anyone has. Well, thank you for your very informative report. Questions from Council? Council Evans? No problem. Um, yeah, just was curious. Uh, this was the first I heard about our electric bikes and patrolling the the trails. Um, curious to know what uh, what uh, was the, the the deciding factor to, to to start patrolling the trails. Are we seeing some incidents there, or is it something we we felt we needed to 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 throw some some time out yeah so um that is um one of the initiatives that was put forward in the grant so if the grant is not successful we'll have to reevaluate on whether or not um we will be doing that or not if the grant is successful then um, we will have monies available to purchase the bikes and then continue on with doing some additional um, patrols and stuff like that um with the grant again we created it with the the mindset of creating a safer community um, and through that is getting out more visible in the areas where you're normally not going to be. So your, your trails, um, areas where it's hard to get by with vehicle and areas where it might take a while to get, get to on foot. So um, it's not a guaranteed. It's going to depend on what happens with, with this grant. Um, and through the grant, part of it was for additional monies for additional patrols. So again, just, just getting us more visible in the community in the areas that we're, we're normally not in. Yeah, and I guess it's a good opportunity to have those conversations that you're trying to initiate. It's a it's a pretty good pretty good place to stop and chat with with people who are using the trails. Absolutely. Okay, thank you for that, Cody. Um, oh, here's my marks. Uh, under a look back at 22, uh, you said addition of primary highway enforcement. Can you? Expand on that a little bit and tell me what that's, that involves. I, I didn't think we had much involvement in primary highways. Yeah, so primary highways, um, because Drayton Valley is town, we don't have much, much of a primary highway. Uh, however, Highway 22 or Cowboy Trail um, does run throughout the community. Uh, it's a little stretch road, but um, prior to having this authority, technically we couldn't do any enforcement um, on the highway. Um, however, once the authorities were granted by the province, um, then we do have, a, have the ability to conduct enforcement um, on Highway 22 now. Um, it is quite common for peace officer agencies to have, have authority on primary highways. Um, so this was just kind of, I'd suggest probably 95% of peace officer agencies do have it. Um, for whatever reason, Drayton Valley didn't have it. So it was just the addition of, of getting that in there. Um, when we do look at, at collisions, um, within the town of Drayton Valley, the serious injury and fatal collisions, the majority of them are along Highway 22. So um, that is an area where we should be focusing some time to do some, some enforcement kind of thing is, is where 
where the where the fatalities and serious injuries are occurring, right? Um, if if you're concerned about monetary money is coming from that kind of thing, it does the money do does come back to the town, the percentage of it, anyways. Um, so it's not like we're just dedicating our time to the province's road kind of thing, and it we don't see any benefit out of it, if you want to call it that. One, we do see the monetary gain, but more importantly, we do see um, the ability to um, hopefully reduce collisions, um, which is a big burden on society. So, yeah, fair enough. Fair enough. I, I, I guess the only concern I have is that we're we're doubling up on that 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 coverage that the the RCMP is generally supplying on those on those highways. Um, uh, that'd be questionable, but sure. <laughs> okay, you you want to get into that? You don't think the RCMP are 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 covering the highways? Um, from the information that, that I've seen so far, um, and from what I know with Depo, it would be limited um, for the amount of time that the RCMP would be actually conducting enforcement in the town of Drayton Valley on Highway 2 specifically when it comes to traffic. Okay, so how much of your time do you think will be spent uh, patrolling or, or uh, um, in, in enforcement on, on the the chunk of highway going through town. Yeah, it is very limited. Again, it's it's not like it's all of a sudden overnight. We're going to be doing a big drastic in, increase. Um, we've had these authorities on the highway since April-ish, uh, give or take. So we, it's been eight, nine, ten months now where we have had authorities on the highway there. Um, it's It's not... I'm going to spend my whole day out on the highway kind of thing, right? It's if you're driving to the CETC, for example, um, now you have options. Now you're going through town or you're going on the highway. If you see something in between kind of thing, you can deal with it. So um, again, it's it's not meant to replace any other agency that, that currently has authority on the roadway. It's meant to supplement. Okay, fair enough. Thanks for that. That's it for me. Thanks. Thank you. Any other questions? Councilor Gamana? Thank you. Yeah, excellent presentation, uh, Cody. You know, informative and all that. So that's excellent. And also, you've done a, your department is doing a great job, doing lots of work there. I was just wondering, you mentioned about in traffic enforcement um, and uh, the tickets that you're giving away and all that. Are you seeing any particular spot or spots that maybe we need to focus on more, maybe more signage, maybe there's more activity there uh, that? Uh, as, as a town we need to work on? Um, at this point, our records management system is still being a little bit more fine-tuned to be able to kind of pinpoint that stuff a little bit better. Um, so my answer is going to be an anecdotal answer from what I can kind of, from what I know kind of thing. A um, couple, couple areas that, that we often get a lot of concerns with is the parking lot um, and adjacent roads to the Omniplex. Um, I would suggest a good chunk of the tickets and warnings do come out of either the parking lot or nearby roadways. Um, that would be kind of the, the main area. Um, and then again, uh, currently the school zone on 50th Avenue at DV Christian School. Um, we do see often lots of people don't like slowing down in that area for some reason. So um, with that in mind, though, it's my understanding that school will be closed within the next year-ish kind of thing. So um, to do improvements in that area, I'm not not sure is really needed at this point. Um, definitely some areas for um, lots of um, the fatal and, and the serious injury collisions. Um, the collision priority areas, if you want to call it that, would be 50th Street, um, and Highway 22 up by Boston Pizza. Mm -hmm. um, and then 50th Avenue, and I believe it's 54th Street, um, the intersection by the Royal Suites. Um, there's a number of collisions that are at that, that location as well. So, um, and then kind of just within the 100 meters ish vicinity, north, east, southwest of 50th Avenue and 50th Street um, is kind of another hot spot for for collisions in general. So um, those are kind of three hotspot areas, if you want to call it that, that if we are doing traffic enforcement, um, if we are trying to impact um, and reduce the number of collisions, those would kind of be areas to focus on. Okay, so are you working with public works and giving you input uh, just to see if we need more signage there or what, what else can we do to? Yeah, so like I mentioned there, uh, throughout the year, we've worked with Alberta Transportation as well as with Public Works um, for the various 
uh, roadways yeah. uh, to improve signage, um, recommend changes, stuff like that. So um, there's definitely a lot of ways to go um, throughout the whole community when it comes to signage kind of thing, but we are taking steps to um, work with our, our other departments to kind of get those ch- signs changed and get improvements and stuff like that. Um, in addition, being part of the community safety committee, um, there are discussions that kind of happen through in that com- uh, committee as well um, as it pertains to kind of traffic and stuff like that. Um, ultimately, um, changes to roadways and stuff like that, though, would would fall under the purview of council and or public works. So. Thank you. Any other questions? Councillor McGee. Thank you, uh, <coughs> Deputy Mayor Ballas. Um, Cody, um, I have a, a couple of questions. I'll, I'll start with um, right now, uh, our staffing, uh, are we at one? Oh, that is correct. All right. um, and we will be at one until maybe spring? Um, at this point, um, we are actively recruiting for the additional community peace officer position. Um, so it depends on kind of how much longer that's going to take for um, that position to be filled, depending on where they're coming from, if there's going to be delays on moving and stuff like that. Um, and then the other the other officer is currently off um, on a leave. Um, I'm not sure when, when that is going to be. Um, hopefully returning sooner rather than later, but. Okay. Um... So when I look through the report, we are short uh, really in, a, in, in many ways. So we're not able to get, we're not able to be proactive in, a, in our work. Um, and I'm thinking of sidewalks because I walk every day. And um, I was thinking at some point in time, I might see some yellow tickets saying, you got to clean up your sidewalks. It's just hard to get to that. You- yeah. Um, what, with being a one one person kind of dealing with, approximately 7,000 um, population when it comes to the, the bylaws and a lot of the provincial stuff. Um, at this point, there's very limited when it comes to proactive enforcement that is done. Um, primarily, it is um, reactive based only. Um, and with that, we, when, when it does come to sidewalks, we, we have dealt with, I have dealt with um, some sidewalk complaints that have come in kind of thing. Um, but again, it's, it's complaint driven. It's not proactive. Um, I don't have the time in the day. I'd love to. Hopefully, once we're back fully staffed, that that is going to be the plan. Is that we are a lot more proactive, um, and then again, the public knows we're out dealing with it. So then they're just going to deal with it without our involvement, right? So that's ideal. Um, again, hopefully, Aprilish, we've got two more staff members, um, but unknown. And I think the uh, sense that. We, we've enacted new bylaws and they've given you the tools, I would say. Uh, it's just the manpower that really is, is, is holding us back at this time. So yeah. uh, if I was talking to citizens, I might suggest that uh, once we have the manpower, you may have to pick up your game a little bit. Yeah, um, definitely. For example, the community standards bylaw, that definitely helped us with dealing with a lot of properties. Um, throughout the summer months, we did have our, our two officers um, in at the time, which definitely... Um, we were able to do a big impact um, with both complaints for unsightly properties, um, as well. We were proactive on dealing with a number of unsightly properties as well, right? So um, I think we had some good strides when it came to the unsightly properties this summertime. Um, but unfortunately, with staffing levels that kind of decreased shortly thereafter and then change of season, um, it has been has reduced the the proactive abilities that that our department can do right now. So um, it is very. Um, call it poor customer service, if you want to call it that, that, that we are giving the, the public right now from enforcement services because we can't give the full attention and detail to every investigation because there is so many that's that's coming up right now, right? So um, I'm doing my best, um, trying trying to stay stay afloat with everyone. And um, the, the, the public that I have been talking to, um, I express this to them so that they're, they're aware and they seem to be understanding that might be a little bit delayed, that I'm not going to be there tomorrow about the sidewalk it might be two days um they seem to be understanding of that which is good so far so hopefully that stays for another month or two that we need it but um i'm hoping that throughout um again once once the addition of this other officer comes in and um the other officer returns that we're in a good shape that we can do a lot more proactive stuff and um hopefully the community starts looking better in other areas that 
it's lacking currently. So. Um, tobacco and vaping reduction. Um, it was, it's an act. And I was curious about the act. Uh, is, is the, the sense is, is that um, we want to uh, con not control perhaps, but to lessen um, vaping and uh, tobacco use. And I think in another act, they talk about alcohol use. And um, so is, is that really the intention uh, under those acts is to reduce? So we... yeah, the tobacco smoke, smoke, tobacco smoking and vaping reduction act. Um, the, it's, it is a large act. It covers various things such as um, the needs to um, commercial um, when they're selling tobacco on the signs that they need to have, that they can't display tobacco, they can't sell to minors um, from the aspect of um, a consumer kind of thing. Um, it controls whethering, whether youth can um, purchase it or not, possess it, different stuff like that. Um, so it is quite it is a broad piece of legislation. Um, it also talks about like smoking in taxis, smoking in workplaces, uh, different stuff like that. So it does encompass a variety of things pertaining to smoking, smoking. Um, but it does, um, I, I would suggest that's the intent behind the legislation is not necessarily to reduce people smoking, but to limit where they can and can't smoke. Yeah, I thought that was the case. I was just interested in the um, in the fact that it talked about reduction, and it's it's, it's lettered as that in the act. Um, you've been getting, uh, I think, a few complaints on uh, cannabis odors uh, within the community. Uh, are we are we we're at reactive at this point? Do we have a plan? Yeah, so that currently falls with um, planning and development. Um, I don't know. I believe Jarek is kind of taking lead on that. I don't know if we want to get into that now or kind of just um, kind of high level that is being currently um, dealt with through planning and development. I think, uh, Jarek, we can do that under your report um, when when it comes forward. We I'll ask the same question. Well, department report. Yeah, I'll just ask that question, so. Know that it's coming. Um, $86,500 for cameras, specific places in, within the community. Um, who, who has access to the camera? Is that the RCMP or just remind me of where we're at on that? Um, so that was approved in the 2023 budget. Um, we're currently working on um, kind of getting some pricing um, and figuring out exactly which cameras, um, which servers, stuff like that we're going to be going with. Um, in addition to that, there's going to be a policy that's going to need to come in front of council to make a final decision on. Um, that policy will regulate who's who has access, um, how, how and where the public can get the video, et cetera. Um, one thing, though, is the cameras are going to belong to the town of Drake Valley, so the RCMP aren't going to have viewing capability per se they would be able to access video if they do need it for an investigation though yeah you would let them access but it's really ours and and we, we have full access to that that's correct they would have to access the video through like a freedom of information request kind of thing um and then it would have to be evaluated on whether or not that that video would be be released to them um alternatively they could always seek a warrant kind of thing but if they can fill out a piece of paper and we can do a FOIP request. It's going to be a lot easier and simpler than, than getting a warrant for that kind of thing. So, um, but it is the proper channels still need to be yeah. followed through that. Yeah. So according to the freedom of information. Yeah. Okay. Cody, thanks very much. Appreciate your report. Thank you. No problem. Any other questions? Just a question, Cody. When I look at the complaints and I see over 50% are animal control or, or community standards bylaw. So those obviously take up a lot of your time. Is there a different solution to reduce the number of complaints? We ban animals? What? Like, that's not a suggestion, by the way. <laughs> thanks, thanks for clarifying that one. <laughs> um, 
as, as I mentioned, uh, we will be reviewing the animal control bylaw in 2023. So um, we do have some challenges currently with, with some of the wording in the animal control bylaw. So hopefully when that comes forward, we can get some kind of improvements that might help with, with reducing some, some of the complaints. Um, again, and kind of going with the unsightlies, I think once we, we started it this summer, and I think as time goes on and the community starts to understand that, that the town is serious about you got to clean up your properties kind of thing, I think we're going to get a lot more voluntary compliance on people will just take care of it on their own. Um, even even this, this previous summer, um, we've had a number of vacant properties that the owners live in other provinces, towns, whatever, um, and they just didn't maintain it. And they haven't maintained it because they weren't required. No one forced them to do it in the past, right? Um, once once we became involved this year, we, we kind of talked about what the process is, how they're responsible for cutting it, stuff like that. Um, and we already seen in 2022 how we talked to them early on in the season once we gave them our first order that you need to do it, they started proactively taking care of it throughout the year. So I think once the community starts to see that they actually have to take care of X, Y, and Z, for the most part, they're going to. Um, so that's going to, I think, remove some of our, our files. Um, and then kind of just going back to that social media piece and that advertising and stuff like that. Um, if If people know that they have to whatever the law is, there's a better chance they're going to comply with it without our involvement. So a um, good example of, of that is snow removal. Um, when when uh, Public Works was going to go to, and do a bunch of um, cleaning of the roads kind of thing, um, my understanding is historically there hasn't been much ticketing um, for vehicles not moving for snow removal in the past. There might have been a little bit of towing kind of thing, but it's been very limited. Um, the first sweep we went out there, I think I ended up issuing 25 tickets, if I recall correctly, um, for vehicles that didn't move for snow removal. All of a sudden, I start hearing from other other, other people in the community on, you guys are ticketing for that? Why, why, why? Right? And now all of a sudden, it, it starts that awareness piece, right? So now next time the signs go out, it's not, well, they're just going to go around. It's I better move. Otherwise I got to pay for it. Right. So I think again, there's from my understanding and, and what I've kind of been able to determine so far is there's been a lack of enforcement in the past. Um, and the community knows that. So I think they've got pretty relaxed in following some of the rules and stuff like that. So, um, as time goes on and they start understanding that the community is actually going to be enforcing the bylaws and the provincial statutes and stuff like that. Um, I think that is going to reduce some of it. In, re in regards to the animal control bylaw in order to make people more responsible, do, does the town need to look at strengthening, strengthening their bylaw, uh, with consequence? I think so. Um, and I think that's part of when we, we bring forward the animal control bylaw, um, there's going to be, um, I would suggest there's going to be a um, proposal for increase in fine amounts. Um, but not only is it, let's put a higher fine amount, that falls back on enforcement services to let's actually do some enforcement, right? So again, I think historically there's been a lot of, well, you're, this is the third time your cat's been at large. Here's another warning, right? To me, that's unacceptable. It's costing a lot of money. It's taken a lot of time to deal with this. So we need to start pulling up our socks on the enforcement side. And no, that's not your third warning this year. You're getting a ticket, right? And now once that monetary penalty starts coming in, uh, maybe I'm going to take care of my cat, right? Not guaranteed. Possibility. Thank you. Any other questions? Well, thank you very much, Cody, for your report. It was an excellent report, very informative. Thank you very much. No problem. Thanks so much. In regards to the report, does somebody from council want to make a motion to accept the Enforcement uh, Services Annual Report as 2022 as information? Council Sheriff? All in favor? All right. It's quarter after 10. Our mayor is back. I'm out of here. We'll take a 10 minute, uh, 15 minute adjournment and uh, reconvene uh, in 15 minutes. Good morning, everybody.
We will reconvene the meeting at 10.27 a.m. and we'll jump back into our decision items. 9.2, discretionary use request. Drive through for a proposed establishment, eating and drinking at 2050 50th Street, lot 12, block three, plan 142147 for development permit DV23-005. Good morning, Mr. Connors. Good morning, Your Worship and fellow council members. Uh, so administration received a request for a drive through combined with a new establishment, eating and drinking to be built at 2050 50th Street. The lot is zoned CGEN or commercial general district where the eating establishment is permitted, but the drive through is discretionary used to be heard by council acting as the MPC. The site currently appears and operates as a convenience store and gas bar. It is situated along a service road off of 50th Street, just north of Highway 22 in the Biomile Business Park area of town. The site is flanked by sparse commercial development to the north, a truck fuel and parking areas to the west and south. The new proposed development is planned to utilize an undeveloped portion of the site immediately north and adjacent to the existing convenience store. The application seeks to build a new building containing a restaurant and the drive through Administration's review of the application is that both the drive through and restaurant proposed either meet or are conditioned to meet the requirements for both uses in the land use bylaw. Administration circulated the application to multiple internal groups and agencies, and with the comments received back, are adding the following conditions to the development permit. A removal or relocation of the existing propane tank on site will be required to accommodate the proposal, and all necessary permits and procedures for that alteration will be required to be obtained. A relocation of the fire hydrant on site will also be required. The applicant has already chosen a new area suitable to fire services and utilities, and it is reflected in the provided site plan, but they will still need to confirm and obtain sign off for more specific elements like the hydrant orientation prior to installation. The application greatly exceeds minimum parking requirements. However, some of the desired stalls are located such as to potentially overlap with access to the underground storage tank for the gas station. The permit is conditioned such that fuel delivery is to be arranged to avoid main dining hours for the restaurant in order to avoid conflicts between patrons and fuel deliveries. Engineering will also require a final plan of utility connections provided and signed off before construction begins. And a garbage receptacle will need to be placed along the drive through and accessible by drivers per land use bylaw section 4.5 requirements. The area is sparsely developed commercial and requires a lengthy trip leaving 50th Street and traveling along a service road to reach the planned drive through as well as multiple avenues for approach mitigating backlog in any particular direction. In accordance with 4.5F of land use bylaw, a traffic impact assessment was viewed as not necessary component for this application. Both the MDP and the Biomile Area Structure Plan identify this location as a planned area for commercial development, but do not get into the specifics regarding the type of commercial development to take place. Administration views the proposal as in adherence to both the MDP and the Area Structure Plan. Administration's recommendation is that Council approve development permit DV23-005 with conditions as presented. The proposed uses as conditioned meet the requirements of the land use bylaw and the discretionary use drive through is not viewed as improper or unacceptable for the location. We welcome any questions or comments you may have. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Any questions for administration? Councilor Evans? Um, just the... Uh the storage tank is 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 what I'm asking uh, about. Um, fuel deliveries to the site may be, be arranged such that they avoid overlap with primary dine-in hours for the restaurant in order to minimize conflict. Do do they have the ability to to uh, request a specific time for those deliveries? And is there enough room for a large truck to to get in there. I, I, I was looking for exactly where they were they were going to have to go in that parking area. Um, it, it looks to me like a big truck pulling in there would block not only the parking but the drive through, etc. But I'm 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 not sure. Like I say, I couldn't see exactly where it was or how they'd kind of situate in there. Thank you for the question. Uh, so with the properties being under the same property owner, there is uh, ability for there to be the stipulations on there that these be arranged in order to not conflict with one another. Uh, if it was two separate owners and it was subdivided, there would be larger issues in conditioning permits uh, for one property that had relevance to a different one. But because they are bundled together, there is the ability to do that. Um, this is not the first time that uh, administration has proposed uh, items like this. There have been incidents where uh, some locations were closer to school delivery areas. So it was 
uh, suggested that these be conditions such that deliveries happen outside of school drop-off and pickup times in order to avoid sort of heavy backlog and, and conflicts in that time as well. Uh, so that is something that can be conditioned on the, the permit itself to be added there. Uh, and then regarding where the tanker goes, currently they do situate themselves uh, in between the island and the fuel tank, sort of in the very top right corner or northeast corner there. So they would be currently situated on top of where all of those stalls are uh, placed on the blueprint there. Uh, those stalls are in excess of the minimum parking requirements. So if need be, they can be removed uh, if it does become an issue and they'd still meet the land use bylaw requirements for stalls on site. They only need 18 uh, and they are proposing 27. So they would still meet it at that instance. Very likely, uh, you would have the truck instead of right on where the stalls are, they would be pulling in on the opposite side, which could create some tightening issues there um, regarding trying to exit back out to the north of the drive through but there should still be access to exit out of the east side of the lot for vehicles. So it's up in the right-hand corner there, mm -hmm. right by those parking spots wedged up into that. Yeah, that and dotted there. cylinder area is the underground tank, and the yeah. circles are the, the access points for it. I guess in the end, uh, if we approve it, it'll be the business themselves that will will be kind of dealing with that. Not, uh, I don't think we'll be getting any calls on it. Mm -hmm. So, thank you. Any other questions for administration, Councillor McGee? It, it was a it was a good question, but if you, if you look on page fifty nine, um, specifically there, uh, the the top piece, there's a little bit of a white area that that's just above those and that's where I typically see the the tanker sitting and uh, I, it, it seems to me that um, you're right they it's a, a similar a, an owner of the same business so they'll have to take the heat for, for blocking the whatever street they have yeah. and I'll make a motion if everybody's ready uh, I think Council Kamana has a question uh, thank you um, I guess just a clarification so the existing convenience store, is this going to be attached to that or is it going to be a separate um, on the uh, on the map? Um, and also about the hours that we just discussed, it's up to the business to figure it out or if there's any, I guess, anything that town need to do if they're not following that hours. Thank you for the question. Uh, so in regards to the first part on the attached to the building, no, it's going to be separated out with the drive through passing in between them and a little bit of a sidewalk area on the side of the building as well. Uh, so it will be a standalone structure separate from the existing convenience store, but they will be relatively close to one another on site. Uh, and then for the second question regarding the uh, hours in particular there, um, specifically, we would be putting a bit of deference to the property owner to sort out what would make sense for them in terms of their main dining hours. We wouldn't sort of stipulate to say you must close at a certain point in, of time and day. And uh, we would have a mechanism as it is on the development permit if this is an issue and it's not being followed through to get it addressed at a later point because it is on the development permit as a condition. Okay. Thank you, Jerry. Uh, and I'm just, uh, Councillor Clark is still online. Nathan, you'll let me know if his hand is up or if there's a question as well. Okay, perfect. Thank you for that. Uh, if there's no other questions, Council McGee, would you like to make a motion? Good, Madam Mayor. Um, I would make a motion that Council approve uh, development permit DV 23-005 with the recommended conditions as presented, and that's uh, attachment 08, uh, the draft development permit. Thank you very much for that. Any comment, question, or debate on the motion? None. All in favor? That is carried. Moving on to 9.3, thank you very much, Jarek. Uh, the appointment of the Deputy Mayor, Mr. Osmond. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, so we have a, an item here today. Um, we have uh, a, it's an eight month schedule uh, that we establish at the beginning of the term of council. Uh, to rotate uh, through the councillors so that each councillor gets an opportunity uh, to uh, fill the position of deputy mayor. Um, so with the beginning of March um, this year, 
Um, the schedule we have established has Councillor Amela Gamana um, beginning his term as Deputy Mayor, and so we just need a motion from Council to make that appointment. Perfect. Thank you very much for that. Councillor Ballas, did you have a question? I object. No. <laughs> Make a motion. You, you just you're doing such a fantastic job. You're not willing to give it up. You're <laughs> you're going to hold on. <laughs> I move that council approve the appointment of Councillor Emilia Gamana as the deputy mayor for the period March 1, 2023 to October 31st, 2023. Perfect. Thank you very much for that. Any comment, question or debate on the motion? Just want to uh, say that thank you very much for your reign as deputy mayor and for chairing. Fantastic job. And uh, uh, you're, you're still part of council. You're not going anywhere, but I appreciate <laughs> all the extra help and support that you've uh, given along the way. And I welcome uh, uh, Amelia on to as deputy mayor and look forward to uh, working closely with you um, over the next few months as well. If there's no other comment, question or debate, then I will ask all in favor. Uh, yeah, <laughs> that is carried. Okay, we will move along uh, to 9.4. Uh, new, pool, new pool Omniplex Complex Traffic Control Signage Plan. Good morning. Um, good morning, Madam Mayor and members of the Council. Um, can we bring up uh, those? All right, so uh, with the opening up... Uh, of uh, Ricochet Center, New Pool, there is a need to reestablish the traffic control signage in that area for the safety of the public. So what is happening, this is the current situation. Um, from the north, uh, this is West Valley Road. Uh, this is Ricochet Center, New Pool. Um, so people are driving, when they are coming from West Valley Road, they are driving through and through this parking lot, and then go into 45 Ave. Um, so right now, and then within the parking lot, when they are, because there is no hindrance and there are no traffic, uh, you know, bumps, um, they are driving when they are coming from 45 Ave. They are driving within the parking lot and and uh, they, they speed and go and approach this road. Um, there's a yield sign here. Uh, there's a yield sign here. From the uh, Ricochet Center, some people, uh, there's the overflow parking here. Some people walk uh, across this road. And um, so this has become a, a really a traffic uh, safety situation here. So what we are proposing here is, go to the next slide, please. Go down, next page. So what we are proposing here is uh, a four-way stop here. Um, and uh, from 45 Avenue, this perimeter road will become a main road. So there is, we will remove the yield sign here. We will put a stop sign here. Um, and we will put four-way stops here. We will have uh, no thorough road here sign on both ends. And there will be a uh, zebra crossing here, zebra crossing over there. Uh, yield sign stays here. And we will put some uh, Jersey barriers so that people coming from this side, they don't go into the parking lot straight away. So we have to streamline some things here. And that's pretty much it. And if council has any questions, they can ask. Otherwise, we are asking that council approves this uh, traffic safety plan, and then we'll go back and do some pricing for the Jersey barriers and we will implement it. Thank you very much for that. Any thank questions, uh, Councillor Ballas? Yeah, thank you. I, I just have some concern about the four-way stop because I think if you're having a major event there, you're gonna have a congestion of traffic and you're not gonna have no flow. So I would 
I know you need stop signs, but I, I think you, you got to have a major flow out of there and, and maybe just two stop signs um, and have that flow coming out of the parking lot and going through. So I think that there is already two stop signs there. Like there is. Yeah, there are. You yeah. Back. So I, I have a decent view. I'm sorry, Bill. <laughs> Bill, are you done with your questions? <laughs> Your comment, okay, thank you for that. Councillor Gamana? I'm gonna make a comment, but it's the other way around, sorry. <laughs> so my my uh, experience so, uh, with uh, going to the aquatic facility, when <clears throat> aquatic facility is used very much, the traffic flow is from aquatic facility to the to out. Um, yes, when there's event at the Omniplex, there will be a traffic flow that way, but when most of the time it's the other way around. So we need to balance the two because right now the stop signs on um, the uh, right there, uh, the aquatic yeah, facility side. here and, and then, then maybe here so when they are turning left. My, what, what I have observed is that there's traffic coming in and stopping. There's no traffic going that way uh, most of the time during the day. So how do we balance that? I don't know. The other option is a very expensive one to make a roundabout here. Yeah. Small and, roundabout. Yeah, we might have to maybe even get a price on that. Just, I know that even with the school, it gets, you know, a little bit crazy come after school when there's something happening at the Omniplex and the pool, and then you'd be closing to the south there in front of the, uh, the fitness center, you'd be closing that all off, like down. The yellow barriers are all down yeah, right there. Yeah. So you'd be closing all that off? So what, yeah, so 45 uh, Avenue, they are coming here, they will go straight. They will go the, straight. And then when they are coming from this side, there will be a stop sign. So right now they have a yield sign which doesn't make sense. So this will become a thorough road, thorough pair. And then, so then once you, if you were to come up that, and then you were to come to... Um, yeah, right there. And then you were gonna, then there's a through road right there. How are you gonna stop people from going through into the parking lot then? Because that's, I'm just thinking if you're going to drop kids off for school, you're gonna be coming in through the south, going up, and there'd be a four way stop, and then you'd probably come straight down south again. You wouldn't go continue to go all the way to the west. So you're still gonna have that people kind of going everywhere within the parking lot, it's still. So, okay, people who are coming from this side, they will, they will stop here to turn left or go straight this way or this way. So four-way stop, that's why we are proposing four-way stop here. Right now, this parking lot, we have to make sure that people are not doing stunts here. Uh, the signage should be proper, and then there will be enforcement part. But I, I really didn't get... Uh, well, I'm just thinking of the congestion you're going to have at that four-way stop, stop if that's the only in and out when, you know, when you've got the swimming pool, when you've got something going on at the Omniplex, when you have school buses coming, you know, taking kids. I know just right now when you exit and you come there that, you know, the bus is lined up and I can't imagine. I think you'll just have a bottleneck if you're having a stop. It, it, it's, I don't think it's going to solve. I think it's just going to make it worse in my opinion. I don't know, right? Because you're closing and you're closing a entry into it, you got to have yeah that flow. So I don't know like what the proposal, what would be the cost on the proposal of this versus you know a roundabout, okay, we right? Can, to have that continual flow or something. I'm not we sure. Can if any, go back and look into that. Anybody has any other questions? Well, Councilor McGee. All right, so we are all traffic enforcement officers here. <laughs> so we're trying to make that decision based on, gee, I got blocked one time and I didn't really like it. I, I, it seems like a, an unusual, I know we have to make that decision, but um, it should be well thought out by, by people that look at that kind of, and I, I don't want to do a study on it. I just think the, um, you know, we're going to have a you know question uh, opposed and, and, and non opposed and and it doesn't feel real comfortable for me to to get into that discussion. 
because I'm not a traffic enforcement officer. This was Thank you for the comment. <laughs> Councillor Evans, another one of our traffic control <laughs> slash counselors. <laughs> so I, I guess in, in the end, we want to keep the flow rolling down the outside of that That's right. parking lot and then bleed Part the, of the traffic, traffic off yeah. into either the, the ricochet center or the school. Um, would it be possible, I wish I had your pointer there, <laughs> Um, when we're running down past the, oh. well, which one am I pushing here? Um, okay. Right okay. there, you got, got it. it. Yeah. Would it be possible to, uh, bring this piece of road more in line with that and then have a, uh, an intersection coming off of there that would bleed the traffic off either way? So say this was a straight through road, you cut off that corner a little bit here mm -hmm. to line them up a little better. And then you move that, expand that intersection over into that. But this is a straight through, you have one stop sign uh, going there, and then you feed the parking lot over here somewhere. Uh, that might get a little, might get a little busy. I'm just trying to, if we can, keep this, keep this a direct connection instead of getting it into the into this intersection and then trying to get people over this way. Because without barricades all the way up here, I think they're just going to kind of go down there and then do what we don't want them to do. But if we really want that to be a main an actual road, maybe we should connect it together. We can certainly look into that. That will be expensive to build a little piece of road. Well, it's not, that that much of a, it's not that much of a, of a piece right there, right? Yeah. That's all we're talking about. And then maybe have an exit. You know, you take advantage of this piece in here that you can just bleed the traffic right off over into this section before it even gets to what could be a, a, a stop sign here. Does that make sense? You know what I'm... Yeah, the, yeah, no, it can be a straight merge. Go there, straight, and merge it on that road. Mr. Osmond, did you have a response for Rick? Uh, well, what I was going to suggest was uh, we had originally put this together because of the change in the traffic flows. We wanted to see what we could do to address, and we kept the scope pretty narrow um, because I think, you know, our, our main goal is to to prevent vehicles from coming in either on the north or south entrance to the parking lot at speed into the parking lot. Because um, the, there's a significant travel speed difference between those two areas. Um, and if you don't have a, a brake for those vehicles to adjust their speed, you're gonna get a number of vehicles coming into the parking lot at speed or flowing out through those intersections um, at speed. So um, we certainly can, there, there, there's a number of the other options. And I think, you know, talking about the realigning the road or a traffic circle or something like that um, would all certainly, I think, address the traffic flow better. Um, but we had simply looked at something smaller in scope, but we can go back and have a look at what those would mean um, for us to do that. Because I think the, the main goal is to make sure that we we have people slowing down before entering the parking lot and clearing those intersections safely. Mm -hmm. There is a uh, speed bumps to the, on the one road all the way up south coming in. Uh, Councilor McGee. You know, I was thinking about uh, the typical mall that you get into, not so much here, but uh, let's say West Ed or any of those malls that they, they control all of these through barricades, curb and gutter. Um, so in fact, it's just a wide open parking lot. You can shoot right, you can shoot left, and maybe that's all it's gonna take is just to barricade it. And, um, curb and gutter, or if that's uh, less expensive than the big barriers. And, and then just say the only, only one way out, and it happens all the time. I'm in Edmonton, I only get one way out, and I think, Jesus, one way out, who does that? <laughs> <laughs> but that's my comment. <laughs> Yeah. And that's why you're here making the decision today. <laughs> yeah. Councillor Ballas. 
Uh, you already covered basically what I was going to suggest with speed bumps, but I, I, I would just like a comment from uh, perhaps our fire chief if uh, if what they may have as suggestions or does it make any difference for emergency vehicles? Um, we haven't consulted them, but we can go back. And oh, he's right behind you. <laughs> Hello? Okay. So um, we haven't consulted uh, our emergency um, folks, um, but we can certainly go back and have another look and come back. Right now, it came from, you know, from, I think, from members of the council or from Rob. Um, that there is, there is an issue. There is a traffic issue and there is a safety issue. And we wanted to get it done before the proper opening of the pool. And, but it looks like it'll take some time now. <laughs> <laughs> Councillor Gamana. Okay, just a comment when you look at, I guess, like Rick mentioned, you know, we're looking at the future, bigger picture. Um, the other observation that I saw yesterday and, and the family day was that both the parking lots were full and there was no place to park. So future proofing, we maybe need, needed to look at another parking lot in the future. When we look at the, the traffic flow, maybe we need to put that into the big picture as well. Just a comment. So I know that you came to us with a uh, report, and I don't think you're leaving with any uh, <laughs> any clearer of a picture of what that looks like, unfortunately. Um, uh, I know that the recommendation is that Council accept new pool Omniplex complex traffic control signage plan for the implementation. Uh, there's been a lot of ideas, and uh, uh, I guess this will work, this won't work going around the table. So um, maybe as Rob suggested, if you can build a little bit um, different of a package or a plan and then bring it back, then maybe have a little bit more discussion when you know what those numbers are and what it's going to cost to implicate some of those. Councillor Ballas, did you have another comment? I was just going to make a motion that we accept this uh, report for information. Yeah, is that fine? We accept it. Uh, Rick, did you have another question? No. No, okay. Your mic was on. That's why I just thought maybe. Oh, sorry about that. That's okay. Okay, go ahead, Councillor Ballas. You're <laughs> making a motion to accept it. Okay. Any comment, question, or debate on the motion? You're going out with a bang today, hey? <laughs> I'll ask all in favor. That is carried. Thank you. You are so welcome. Okay, moving along to uh, 9.5, Drayton Valley and District Historical Society Gazebo Requests. Mr. Osmond. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, so the Drayton Valley and District Historical Society has approached the town with a proposal to build a community gazebo. Um, through some uh, discussions after the last time they were in and spoke to council, um, the society has raised uh, a significant portion of the project cost uh, so far to date, and they're now in the process of applying for a grant uh, to finish their fundraising. Uh, in order to proceed with that grant application, they had a number of questions for council, um, and so I, I just brought them forward for council's consideration. Uh, so their questions are, upon completion of the project, will the town take on the ongoing care and maintenance of the gazebo. Um, and so we do have uh, a number of gazebo type infrastructure in the community that we manage through our parks uh, department. And so um, that's certainly something that could be contemplated. Um, will the town to have, uh, agree to have the gazebo cited in the Deby lands and be considered part of the feature park proposal recently reviewed by council? Um, and uh, so that was uh, at the last meeting, uh, we provided a preliminary high level look of what a feature park could look like in that area. And so the group is asking whether we would consider citing the gazebo in that plan. And then uh, finally, uh, they are requesting a letter of support for the grant application itself. So uh, if council could uh, provide some direction, I'd be happy to uh, pass on the direction and decisions to the historical society so they can proceed with their grant chasing. 
Perfect. Thank you very much for that. Councilor Ballas, do you have a question? Yes, thank you. I, I'm just curious as to why they want to change the location uh, because originally it was meant to be down on the museum property and uh, that's where I thought it would be more practical uh, versus putting it somewhere else. I can respond to that. So I had a meeting with uh, Charlie Miner. When we had met with the historical uh, museum, we had met, um, I think, with everybody from the... the um, the society and we had discussed the location of the gazebo being down there. We talked about things like vandalism, the homeless, things like that. There was talks of putting in a little fire pit in that and we said how, you know, it could get burnt down. So um, Councillor McGee had suggested, what about Deby lands? You know, there was a concept plan coming forward for something to be developed there. So they took that back to the board and they talked about where in the community would be a good location, and they actually liked the location of the Debye, Debye lands. They wanted to know that um, what would kind of be the long-term planning for this area, and they felt that moving it closer to the heart of the community, it would get more use. With being out there, it might not get the use that it was, and it might get vandalized. So the board decided that the Debye lands was a great location for it. They'd love to see it there. They think it would be a, a great place for the seniors to go and, um, you know, just have a little place to sit and things like that. Uh, I had shared with Charlie also that we had a concept plan that was coming or that came to council. And there's been discussions with um, a company in town as well about uh, developing that area in the, uh, in the future. So they liked that. Um, and then one of the questions were, who is going to look after the gazebo um, for, you know, just kind of keeping an eye on it for garbage and just upkeep, things like that. So that was one of the questions, um, as well as they're applying for a grant for the rest of the funds. They've already raised $31,000 for the gazebo. They're going to be approaching uh, the Rotary Club, uh, Drayton Valley Tourism and Hospitality, Drayton Valley Community Learning for additional funding, Brazo County uh, to raise the funds because I think it was $150,000. Is that correct for the entire project? And so they still have some funds to raise. So um, they were wanting to apply for a grant, which they feel confident in, and they were looking for a letter of support to go along with that as well. Go ahead, Councillor Ballas. It was under my impression that the idea of having the gazebo was to enhance the visibility of the museum. I do not see how that location is going to enhance any visibility of the museum or be of benefit to them. Uh, personally, but that's that's my opinion. Thank you for that, Councillor Gamana. No, thank you. No, I, I again, my opinion. I agree with Bill's opinion. <laughs> um, so, my concern is that um, DB land. We haven't had a conversation in council about what we are doing with that. Where we are going with the uh, the lands. It's it's a prime location. Uh, uh, in our community, um, and I, I think we need to have a more robust discussion on what's our vision for for that land and the other lands. and And I think we were going to do that at some point about a year ago, where we had the land uh, uh, list of lands that the town owned, and we were going to go one by one and and figure out uh, what are the uses or future uses that we are going to do. We never had that discussion yet, so I'm assuming that we are going to have that discussion at some point. Um, and um, rather than going on one-offs, we need to um, be more, um, I guess, future and vision focused. So that's my concern. I this is a great project, uh, and I agree with Bill that if if it is uh, near the uh, the museum, that gives more exposure to the uh, uh, museum as well as brings more people. To that area so that's my concern thank you thank you for that councillor mcgee well interestingly enough i'll disagree uh with both bill and amilla um i think that the location that they uh that they put forward when i first had a conversation with uh mr minor was so far out of the way that you wouldn't even get the use out of it and the only issue that might arise is perhaps people that not, might need a place to stay overnight and those types of things um, uh, bringing it back up to the, uh, to the center of the community under the guise of the uh, um, historical society 
uh, through donations, uh, and, uh, and, and Councillor Gamana is right that we have not had a robust discussion about what to do with that land. We're going to have a robust discussion about, and we also know that, uh, Council, uh, that Mr. Miner started this project a year and a half ago and has advanced it to $30,000. So let's just get ahead of that and say it's a year and a half down the road. We've got a concept plan. It looks good. Gazebo goes here. And quite frankly, we can make that decision in a year and a half. Um, and I suspect we will make the decision to put it on the Debye lands. So that's my, uh, my comments on it. I, I think it's, uh, we've got concepts, they're down the road. Um, and when you talk about one-offs, everything that we do is one-offs. We were just dealing off in one-offs at the, at the parking lot. I'm thinking that that's how we react to things. And that's how uh, the business of politics sometimes works. So um, I'm of the view that we go ahead and we say to them, we'd be interested in having further discussions of putting the gazebo on the Debye lands and that we, we, um, we support the, uh, and would, would write a letter of support for a gazebo and, um, and go forward. Anyway, that's my view. Thank you very much for that. Any other comments? Uh, I'll just add that I know that there were some questions here um, and there's various inputs of where the location of that, you know, potential gazebo should be. Um, I know that some of these can be worked out as the project starts and things like that, but I think the urgency um, maybe would just be for the letter of support for the grant application. That way, if we give the letter of support for the gazebo, they can get it out there. And then it also helps to strengthen when they're presenting to the Rotary and community foundation and things like that. So um, I know that we do have to have further discussion on all of our lands, including the Debye land. So that's something that's going to have to go on a future agenda to look at. Um, we've had a concept plan come forward um, and we've had other discussions. So I think we need to kind of decide on what the next step is there. But today I think maybe if we can even just as part of this request is just look for a letter of support and the others I think will come in the next few months. Councillor Evans. So the issue seems to be the location, um, but I'm okay with, with kind of moving forward, not knowing the exact location. I mean, there's nothing, there's no map or anything. I, it's just on the Debye land somewhere. Um, but I think we got to support these folks. They put in the work. Uh, they're willing to raise the, uh, the money and the, the town gets a nice piece of infrastructure that they're just required to maintain. Um, yeah, I think uh, the right thing to do would be to, uh, to accept it and uh, support them, in my okay. opinion. Would you like to make a, a motion? Sure. I am going to, uh, to include everything, though. Okay, well, you make whatever motion you'd like to make. <laughs> okay, and then we'll see how it goes. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, I'm going to go with the recommendation there that Council support the Drayton Valley and District Historical Society Gazebo Project by providing a letter in support of the grant application, approve the siting of the gazebo on Debye lands as part of the feature park concept plan, and agree to assume care and maintenance of the gazebo following the completion of the construction. Thank you very much for that. Any comment, question, or debate on the motion? Councillor Gamana? Thank you. Um, if, you if I may, uh, Councillor Evans, I would like to make a friendly amendment to your motion. Um, leave the uh, location out and, and, and the rest. Well, leave the location open so, you know, in future we can have those robust discussions and, you know, hopefully not one-offs and, and have a vision. <laughs> Uh, going forward <laughs> on, on what we're going to do these, uh, on these uh, lands, especially I feel that, DB, like I said, DB land is a very prime location for our community. So I need to accept or not accept the friendly? Yeah, so we'd vote on your motion or you would accept the friendly amendment? You know, in, in my mind, it's... Uh, it's open enough that it just identifies the Debye lands, not where exactly on those Debye lands that we 
that we located. Um, I don't know. Okay, I'll accept your your friendly amendment if that'll get the support of you two grumps over there. All righty. I, I, I understand what you're I saying, and it, motion, it, it makes logical it sense. Yeah. Okay, so there was a friendly amendment made by Councillor Gamana to um, remove the... <clears throat> The site uh, uh, of the gazebo to be the Debi lands. Did you get that? Free, perfect. Okay. Uh, any comment, question, or debate on the amended, friendly amended uh, motion? I'll just make the comment that um, I think the Debi lands is a perfect place for the gazebo. I think that it's a wonderful place for the park, and to, I'd love to see that um, the middle of the town be expanded. I know that we've had some. Uh, work being done there to clear the the brush and it looks absolutely fabulous. I think, you know, having the seniors there and to have access to better trails and walkability and to have a park there and all that, I think it would just be absolutely amazing. I know that we've been talking with some companies in the community as well that like to put into some funds and, and reclimate that area as well. So um, I'm looking forward to having a discussion of what the future of the Debi lands looks like and um, hopefully we'll see um, that site grow. But there is a motion on the table, and I will ask uh, all in favor. All opposed? That is carried. Um, I think we have one more, 9.6, picnic table locations. Mr. Malik. Hmm? Madam Mayor, members of the council, uh, this RFD is about the locations of picnic tables. Um, as part of the town beautification project, a budget of 20000 was allocated in 2023 budget for about 10 picnic tables uh, to be installed at various locations in the town. Uh, administration has selected a design of picnic table that fits into the budget. Um, and uh, we have attached a picture of the table and also we have proposed the locations and uh, in with this RFD we are asking council to approve the locations so that we can go ahead. Perfect, thank you very much for that. Any comments or sorry, any questions for administration? So um, can we go one by one on slide please? Okay, you're just gonna show us. Okay, so this is the design we have chosen. Um, this will go into 10 locations, Sakura Park. We have shown the location over there. Yeah. And then we Can have I just the Sunrise Pond. A second on in, on, in regards to the picnic tables. For people with mobility issues, if they're in a wheelchair, how do they access that? Good question. But then if we put chairs, it will it will hinder wherever all the picking. Is there just a possibility that one of those seats could be just swung to the side? Yeah, we can uh, we can um, uh, remove one of the panels. Or you could have the four, like Councillor Ballas is suggesting, or suggesting, and it would just have an arm that would open for mobility, right? Something like that, if you like the the look of that. Sure, we can look into that. We we can see what options are available. Sure, yeah. Councillor Evans. Uh, yeah, I agree. You could do something. You could probably even cut the ends off of two of those benches to shorten them up, and you may have enough room to. Uh, That's right. Uh, but I've, I'm wondering, uh, is it just the central pedestal that's supporting this thing? That's right. I, I would be. So, are you going to put like a cement pile in cement the ground and then hook yeah. that central pedestal to that? That's right. We pour. Uh, a big foot. Uh, yeah, a footing underneath yeah. there. And then... Um, Boy, I'd still be concerned about kids jumping on those things and the the twist that they could generate on that central. 
So uh, we looked into different designs. They were quite expensive. Um, this was fitting into our budget, plus the installation, the cost of this whole thing, assembly, and the installation with the cement pouring and everything. It was fitting into 20,000 budget. So, so two thousand a piece would get you this this table and the footing and yeah, them installed. Be, yeah, that's it's pretty good. One, one suggestion question. Um, I know that. Uh, do, do we have a welder on staff? No. No way. Okay. I, all, all I was going to suggest was that in the neighboring municipality. Uh, every year they build about 10, 15, get their welder to weld it. It's a pretty simple design. And they get their, excuse me, <laughs> they get their summer students to uh, bolt all the wood to them and stain, stain all the wood, then bolt it to the frames that they've made. Um, you know, I, I don't know if there's an interest in, in looking at that, looking at their design and seeing if we can get them done Cheaper, but that's a that's more or less a standard shape of a picnic table, which also gives you the opportunity to have uh, people yeah. with mobility issues a, a, a wheelchair at either end, as opposed to the the table surrounded. Yeah. Um, so why we were pushing because uh, there is a lead time, and we thought that they, I mean, someone is coming, we should order it as soon as possible. Otherwise, we are also preparing the beautification plan, which will we will bring the other components to it. Um, well, we can go back and look into the other designs and see. Uh, and is this a local company building these? Uh, no, I don't think so. It is from catalog. Oh, because yeah. it would be, I mean, in my opinion, it would be nice to be using somebody local, right? Whether it is our partners at the county that we're using or there's lots of welders and you know, I think entrepreneurs out there that could put us together a picnic table, my suggestion rather than sourcing it hey. from a catalog. Councilor? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think, you know, if you wanted to take the, take the time to, to run over and talk to those folks, uh, you could see the, the design that they have. It's pretty basic. And I'm sure that you could, you could measure up all the pieces and give that to a, to a shop here in town. They could weld you all the frames, and then uh, you just uh, again you could you could get some some laborers uh, as soon as they arrive um, to stain all the wood and uh, bolt it on. It's all carriage bolts, right? This is with the county. Um, uh, yeah, the county's design. I, I just use that as an example. Exactly. Um, but I think if you just went over, measured all the pieces, uh, took that to. Uh, to a, a fabricator here, a welding shop, they could cut all the pieces, weld it all together for you, and you guys could just bolt on the on the wood afterwards. And I think I would prefer a table that is uh, w without that 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 central support that that really worries me. If you get four or five kids standing on one side of that thing, messing around, jumping up and down. I'm not sure how strong that central, e even with a footing underneath there, it's only as strong as the as the 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 bolts that are attached to that flange in the center there, and that's going to be a lot of a lot of torque there. And if we if we break them suckers or rip them out of that footing, then that means pulling the whole table out of there, redoing the footing. Uh, whereas if we just do like a standard, more standard table, we have the opportunity for those wheelchairs to come in and we won't be busting it up, even if we, you know, attach them to the ground somehow so they can't move them. Uh, at least they can't all jump on one side and twist the thing right out of the ground. Just my opinion. And for that, Thank Mr. You. Osmond? Um, so if we, we get the direction today, I mean, I think Abbott was hoping that we could talk about the locations a bit sure. more. Sure, let's talk about the location but and if, then we can get some yeah, details if, if on Yeah, if the council decides to provide the direction for us to relook at the procurement of the tables, um, design source, all of those things, because we've we've gone through that process. Um, so we we can we can go again and look at some other things, uh, but it there could be an issue with project delays at this point. Um, so I think just, until we reach out, yeah, no. I mean, we even have school yeah. that does welding and construction, right? I think it would just it's definitely worth if we can use local and support, then 
let's let's do that right or our partners yeah and yeah. and part of our procurement process is to look at local options yeah. um, and so I don't know that we looked at um, bringing a design and having them fabricated but we would have looked at all the the local options as well um, so I mean we can certainly do that but at this point we've we've gone through that procurement process um, and so we're I thought Abbott said we've got a bunch of work in. Catalog. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. Okay. All okay. right. Moving on to the locations. Um, Skura Park and Sunrise Pond. Are we okay with that? Yeah. Okay. Rotary Park. Yeah, yeah. Just keep going through them all. Uh, Rotary Park and uh, Little Lions Park. One over there, two over there. Mackenzie Park and Ivan Toe Park, one and one. Wayfinder location, Sunrise Park. So Wayfinder location, you know where the uh, McDonald's. Beach Volleyball? No, the, where the McDonald's is. We, oh, yes. We will have yeah. that. Two over there and one in the Sunrise Park. That's it. Hey. Ten locations. Ten locations. Okay. So uh, if there's no other questions, what we're needing is we're needing... Uh, would you have a question? Okay, Councillor Sheriffs. Um, uh, is there a plan to put one or maybe two in front of the library here? In this proposal, there's none, but yeah. if you... If, if Council wants, then we can certainly look into that and drop one of those over there. I thought maybe that would be... Oops. A good idea. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. There's two at the the wayfinder. I think you had maybe take one from there and put mm -hmm. one here. Yes. Yeah. The volleyball so, park is the beach park. It's used all the time, especially in winter. <laughs> um, yeah. No. Just a suggestion. I'd I'd, yeah. I'd probably like to see one here in front of the building. Yeah, that would be nice. Mr. So, Osman. Separate from the beautification projects that are in the budget, um, administration has been looking to source a couple of picnic tables for the front lawn oh, uh, in front of this building. Um, so they weren't included in these 10, but we are looking for some that we can install there because uh, we've had some interest from the public and from the staff. So. Okay, perfect. Is there a member of council that would like to make a motion? Um, Oh, Sorry, uh, I just want to mention uh, Tom Thompson has just mentioned that uh, in Memorial Park here, um, enforcement is going to put uh, one picnic table over there. So oh, there will be additional, but not from this budget. Okay, oh, yeah. that'll be nice. Yeah. Okay, if there's no other questions, is there a member of council that would like to make a motion? Councillor Evans? Yes, because, yeah. Yeah, and we will. I'll make the motion that uh, Council approves the proposed locations for the new picnic tables and, uh, and uh, we'll wait for administration to bring back any new design proposals. Do I even need to include that, or you just want to approve the locations? Uh, so the, the standard practice would be for, once we have the approved budget, for administration to move through that procurement process without bringing back. So if council wants to see designs to approve picnic tables, then we should include it in the motion. So I guess the question is, do we want to see the design or do we just want to go ahead and let these folks do their jobs? <laughs> I think that it's, I think a design. Yeah, I think I, I would like, I definitely want to trust it or administration to do the job, but I also want to ensure that we're using, you know, local contractors when we're constructing these. That's the only thing for me, right? So. Okay, so I'll leave the motion the way it is. And then you can bring it back and tell us what you're going to build and who you're going to get to build it. Is that fair? 
joke. I know it's a little, little over detail. A little hands but. on, but. <laughs> All right, thank you very much. Okay, so there's a motion on the table. If there are uh, any comment, question, or debate on the motion? Um, yeah, we didn't need to ha an amend the location. Rob has picnic tables um, coming or looking, sourcing for the front, and then Tom has for Memorial Park an additional as well that's not part of the proposal. Okay, there's a motion on the table. I'll ask all in favor. That is carried. Moving along to 9.7, our closed session. Is there a member of council that would like to move us into closed? Councillor Kamana, all in favour? That is carried at 11.24 a.m.